Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. The Clever Investor Show. Hey there, Clever Investors. Barbara here. Welcome back to The Clever Investor Show. Today, we got one of my favorite human beings in the real estate game. A former student here at Clever Investor. Yes, now sir. turned multimillionaire, one of the greatest experts at the Airbnb game. He is bulging out of his shirt, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he is sexual chocolate at his finest my good friend and yes, superstar tj to johnny's in the bro. house today baby yes, let's, go. let's go welcome to the show man appreciate you brother you appreciate do look you. good what's the secret to being is it you smell successful and you look yeah. successful and you are successful you know it starts it starts with the body you know what i'm saying we get our bodies moving in the, early in the morning and everything else follows all That's right it. i like that i like that well we need some tips man because you're looking good <laughs> um look tj grew up in uh, uh you're originally from nigeria originally absolutely yeah man, i heard me and um vina jetty were talking the other day and yeah. i because I, I called her one of the smartest people i've ever met yeah. and she said you know us indians we're just so smart but however she gave me a fact and i mm. couldn't believe it she said Nigerians mm. are the most educated group of immigrants in the United States. Is this that true? Is, this is true facts. This is true facts. And, and you know, because w one thing about our culture is how much we prioritize education. So I'm not surprised by that stat at all, because especially for me growing up, you can imagine literally it was all about education, 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 you're either an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. I mean, it is literally mm. one of those, those are your four options. And so you can imagine me doing real estate full time and what my family thought about it at first, but they're happy now. So it's all good. Well, you, you ended up being an engineer. Yes, I did. Look, yeah. that, so, so, so mama was right. Mama was, she, mama she, was, she pushed yeah. you in the right direction. She, you know, what's interesting. I didn't even, I wasn't pushed to be an engineer. I, okay. I didn't even know much about being an engineer when I got to college. I got to college wanting to do architecture. I wanted okay. to be an architect. And then I realized that architecture wasn't really playing to my strengths, which was mathematics. You don't need much math to be an architect at all. And so I said, man, I want to do something that plays onto my strength. And I found out about engineering school and how much you need mathematics for engineering. And I finished my engineering degree and I have a, I got a mathematics minor on accident. <laughs> so much so. <laughs> so and then you yeah. end up, you wake up one day, you're on and you, you were in the, Oil business. Yes. You end yes. up on a tanker in the middle of nowhere. We're riding in the vessels, man. Riding. Well, you know, they're, they're installation subsea vessels. You know, we, were on a, we weren't in a tanker subsea, but we were on the boat, on the rigs for sure. Yeah, on a rig. That's what yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. All right. So so let, let's just kind of walk through your evolution to get to the point where you become this, because you were making money. Uh, you yeah. know, you got, you got a college degree. Yeah. You got a great job. You were making good money. Um, eventually you found real estate yeah. and real estate investing. And now you're doing, uh, real estate full time. You are an expert in Airbnbs. You got, but just t talk to me about your portfolio <laughs> and then we'll walk backwards. So people kind of know where you're at right now. Cause yeah. you're doing really cool stuff with like boutique hotels yes. in the Airbnb space. Talk, talk about that. Absolutely. So right now our portfolio, we're about, well, we had, it's interesting because we had close to 50 doors, but now we scaled back to about 32 but we're and and that's that's only because we got we actually got rid of a few of our arbitrage units and and people will say well TJ you you do arbitrage to you do arbitrage guy yes I am doing arbitrage we love arbitrage but those one arbitrage units that were one unit over there you know making me a few hundred dollars a month or this unit over there that were pretty spread out the one Z's the two Z's we got rid of all of those because it weren't weren't that they weren't profitable. They just weren't necessarily serving our business at the direction that we're going. So we're doing more boutique hotels, like you mentioned earlier. So we want multiple doors in one location. So that is the focus. And so now we're at about 32, but we'll probably be well over 100 by the time the year is over, for sure. They're dope projects, too. Yeah, like, yeah, they're nice. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, explain the two different ways to make money yeah. in Airbnbs real fast. So there's actually three different ways. And actually, there's more than three. But but the main ways is, for one, you can be considered a landlord host, which is like myself, which is like yourself, meaning like whether you own a piece of real estate and you live in it and you rent out additional property, or whether you own a piece of real estate, you live in it, and you were like me that were gone six months, seven months out the year, and you rent it out full time while you're gone. Or you have a property that's a full-time investment property that's a short-term rental, you're considered a landlord host. And then there's rental arbitrage, which is the most, probably the one that's grown 
over time and the property the lowest barrier to entry. This is essentially where you're renting the property and you're, you don't own it. You're renting it and then reselling the use of it. So we rent it long term under a corporate lease and then we resell the use of it short term after we furnish it. And so that's rental arbitrage essentially, which is being the middleman. And I think everybody knows in business that there's a lot of money to be made as a middleman. <laughs> and so then there's co-hosting, which you don't arbitrage it. You don't own it. You're essentially managing somebody else's as a host. So you facilitated somebody else's right to be a host. And where co-hosting is essentially you positioning yourself to say that, hey, you're the host. You're managing it. Is your your listing, but we're going to manage it for you. And so those are the three main ways to get into the game. And it doesn't matter, even though the means of acquisition could be different, your means of execution is the same. Whether you own it, whether you arbitrage it, whether you co-host it, it's the same system and foundation that you need to run it, which is why the people that are set up properly in this business can do either or and still go crazy in this business for sure. I want to get into the systems on what allowed you to scale that business. Yeah, and yeah, let's yeah. talk about some of the money. I want to, I want to, I want you to yeah. impress us all with how much money we can make <laughs> as an Airbnb host. And I also want your opinion on is now a good time to be in here, mm. be in the Airbnb business. But before we get there, let's backpedal a little bit. So you, you, you now are at this place. You're speaking on stages. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a thought leader in this space. You grew your personal brand. I love everything you're doing on the personal you, brand side of things, pumping out tons of great content. How can people find you anyway? Uh, at Instagram at T J Tajani, T J T I J A N I. All right, go check out TJ. Um, you're building this personal brand and uh and you're teaching other people how, how to get in the game, but it started off on this oil rig in the middle of nowhere. Oh, so man. how'd you get into the real estate game? So for me, because because I was I I was able to work through through our college and put myself through college and and it was interesting because for me growing up, I wasn't at being an immigrant. It's interesting because I didn't get my citizen. I didn't become a citizen until I was 26 years old, but I came to this country when I was eight years old. And because of that, you know, when you graduate from high school, I, was, I got into college, but I want, they wanted me to pay out-of-state tuition because I, I didn't have papers, right? And so for me, it was like I went and talked to one of the guys that came, one of the deans, he came and visited my high school. And I said, man, hey, look, you know, my mom, my mom told me not to tell people about our situation, right? But I really want to go to school, but I can't afford, we can't do out-of-state fees because I got into every college I applied to because I was top 5% of my class. And so he said, man, I've never talked to anybody so ambitious. Come meet me up. We, we, he, he gave me a form. I went to go get it notarized. I brought it back to him. And two weeks later, I was granted in-state tuition at the University of Houston. So, which was awesome, but that was like half the battle. So now the other battle is how, how the heck I'm still going to pay for college. And so then after that, I got, I got in, I, I, I went up and talked to the people at the financial aid office. The people at the financial office said, hey, um, um, here's what we can do for you. We can, you owe tuition before we can even register for classes. But what we can do is we can defer your tuition payment to the end of the semester. And I said, well, well what does that look like? And they said, well, you just have to pay interest on it. And I said, well, how much is the interest? They said 5% interest. Me being a math guy, I knew that wasn't that bad. So I said, okay, defer it. Right now, can you defer it while I'm here in front of you? <laughs> so she deferred it, and that's how I was able to get registered for classes. And so then I went to every single mall, every McDonald's, every Burger King. I went to the JCPenney's, every store in every mall, hitting them with the same exact 30-second elevator speech. <sighs> I'm not supposed to talk about this, but here's my situation. Can you give me an opportunity just to work? I don't care what I got to do. I just want to earn some money. One guy at a foot action store said, you know what? I can't pay you on salary plus commissions like I do everybody else, but I can put you on just commissions. If you're willing to do that and work your butt off, then you'll be able to, you, you can work, you can work here. And I said, listen, I'll take it. So I started selling shoes at the store and I started, I was became the best salesman that they had. And at the time, retros, whenever Jordan retros came out, people were lined up around these malls for for shoes. And so I had about five faithful customers that would pay me every month. When, when the pair of Jordans came out, they would pay me $500 just to hold the shoe. It did not go towards the cost of the shoe. Just to hold it for them so they don't have to stand in line was $500. So I was making an extra $1,500 to $2,000 a month just from that alone. And so the money I was making from shoes, then I was take, I would clean up and I would buy all the Jordan apparels, all the Nike apparels. I would clean them up. I would buy them for like five cent, five do, um, about five cents on a dollar because I applied my discounts. And I would take them back to the dorm rooms and sell, sell them. At, I was actually wholesaling these. I was selling for, for because they were retail for $6, I was selling for 30 So doing that, <laughs> holding shoes for people, being on the sales floor, I was making pretty decent money, four to 5000 a month, for working at this foot action store, being paid under the table. <laughs> and so this is literally how I was able to put myself through college, put the money away, 
and I paid my own way through college that way. And I was able to graduate, got my engineering degree, worked worked in oil and gas, and then got into real estate Ooh. because I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. And that's how I got turned on to it, brother. Dude, the hustle is real. <laughs> I love it, man. I see, you know, and that's why you're successful, TJ. Man. That energy yeah. of like whatever it takes. Like, whatever look, takes. I got a challenge. Yeah. I want to put myself through college. I don't have a, a way to do it. Yeah. I can't afford to pay tuition up front. Let's find a workaround. Let's yes. find a way to pay for it then. Then, then now, now you're reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, which we both have that in common. Yes. I read that book. It planted that seed. That I didn't do seed. anything immediately with it, but eventually I got into real estate because that was, that's the book that taught me about assets oh, and liabilities man. and really just got me thinking like, damn, I want to live tax-free someday. Mm -hmm. oh, I want to yeah. own real estate someday. I want cash flow someday. Yeah. 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 That, 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 that book, my boy gave me that book. He handed me the book. He said, bro, I literally watched you hustle your way through school for six years. You need to read this book. And he gave me the book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. I took it offshore with me and I read it twice in three weeks when I was offshore and I couldn't get off the boat faster. Get me off this boat now. I need to go buy some assets ASAP. And that was a mentality getting into it. And I started, I started getting to buy and hold and wholesaling at the same time. Yep. And eventually you Google and this crazy guy, Cody, shows up. He showed checks up. Checks the Lamborghinis. Yeah, oh, man. I saw I saw this crazy guy's ad with his, with his crazy Lamborghini uh, pulling up to people's properties. And I said, man, listen, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> and so, man, it's crazy, Cody. Like, I literally, this was 2014, uh, really 2013, where you really think about it. I, I purchased that course. And I never forget it. Here's the thing. I spent seven grand on that course. And I spent seven grand on that course. And I put out, I did exactly what it told me to do. I put out my first yellow letter campaign. It was actually a post a postcard campaign. I put it out there and some other people were reaching back out to me. And that first campaign that went out, I had a guy who reached out to me in the morning when I got to work. He said, man, I'm interested in selling this property. My coworker's like, hey, we're going to go grab Vietnamese for lunch. I said, don't worry about it. I got plans for lunch. I went, met the seller, put the property on the contract that day. And I had it sold in two weeks. And that was my very first deal. And But what's interesting is I was out here. I was like, okay, well, I'm out here. Real estate investor, wholesaler. Listen, this is where I belong. This stuff is cake. Easy money. So that took two weeks to get my first deal. Ask me how long it took me to get my second deal. How long like, did it take you to get your second deal, TJ? Almost six months to Ooh. get my second deal. And, here, and here's what's crazy. I did the same exact thing to get my first deal. It didn't work. I spent, I did another campaign. It didn't seem like it worked. I just did another campaign and it didn't work. I'm like, man, what the heck? <laughs> what is going on? And so I thought stuff was sweet. And but I realized that the consistency factor is going to be very important if I want to keep along this journey. And so when people come to me, sometimes they'll say, oh, well, because people come to me all the time and say, I want to get into short-term rentals. I've been wholesaling. Wholesaling is hard. I think short-term rentals is more what I want to do. And I tell them, I say, well, for one, for one, you think stuff is sweet over here on the short term rental side. You think you can come in and just put a property up on, on, on rent, put a property on the contract that you want to rent and just put, put it up on Airbnb. I think you're going to make some money. I'm telling you right now, that's not, it's nowhere near, Airbnb space is nowhere near what it used to be when I got into it. It's nowhere near as easy. Stuff is not that sweet over here. And, and what the, when people tell me, because just literally last week, a young lady came to me. She said, well, I've been wholesaling and I don't think wholesaling is for me. And I said, well, how long have you been wholesaling? She said, well, about, about two months, but it's, I haven't really gotten a deal. And I told her, I said, well, you haven't even been in it long enough to know if it's for you or not. Your consistency, your discipline in the host, because wholesaling in theory is, is, is easy, right? Like you put a profit in the contract and you sell the contract. It's like I compare it to running. It's like one foot after the other. But if you tell me, well, TJ, go run a marathon today. I would say, heck no. The same thing with wholesaling. Like it's a challenge. You have to be consistent with it. So, uh, but on the short-term rental side, a lot of people think that you can just come in because the barrier to entry seems low. And yes, there's a lot of listings that came onto the marketplace, especially since I got into it. But it's nowhere near as easy as it used to be for sure. Well, you know, and, and just to clarify to everybody, you got a course plus mentorship. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And then you came to events and you were you were up in the mix. I remember the first time I met you was you were volunteering for one of our yeah. one of our uh, little workshops that yes. we were doing at my office. And uh, I remember thinking, dude, that guy's got the it factor. Oh, you, man, you definitely had it. And it's cool to see your journey. You know, for wholesaling, I was the opposite. It took me 14 months to get my mm. first deal. And then only about two months to get my second deal mm. and only about two weeks to get my third. Yep. So it happens, you know, you, you are 
1 million percent right when it comes to the consistency. I call it mastering the mundane. You really got to like work the boring work. Oh, you have to. And it's repetitive and there's money in the follow-up. Like about only about 15% of my deals happen within the first 30 or 45 days of meeting a seller. Yeah. 85% of my deals happen over the next 12 months yep. in the follow-up. That's right. Because not everybody's ready at that time. Like they're, they're starting to consider it. You know, there's, there's really three buckets of sellers. Have to sell, like shit has hit in the fan. Medical issues, legal issues, divorce, relocation. They're out of money. They're out of runway. Their house sucks. Something's going on where they're in that have to sell bucket. Yep. And then there's the, there's have to sell. There's, I'd like to sell, but I'm not quite there yet. But maybe if the price was right, that's that middle bucket. And that's where the majority of people are that do contact us initially. And that's why follow up so strong. And then there's the people that are like, if you overpay for my property, yeah. I may sell it, but I really, if I ever did sell it, I'd go through an agent. They're like, exactly. the, I, I don't have to sell bucket. And wholesaling is a grind, man. It's a young man's game. Yeah. There's a lot of energy that's involved. Systems are very important. And, and especially nowadays, yeah. you need some unfair advantages. Like you mentioned, man, back in my day, when I first got into Airbnbs, it was sweet. Well, back in my day, when I first got into wholesaling, there wasn't 50 billion gurus that Cody yeah. Sperber trained <laughs> that now are out there pumping out uh, wholesalers left and right. And you really have to have some unfair advantages, yeah. like maybe using AI technology in, in, mm. to generate better leads. Yeah, You know, like lead, lead gen is important. You can never shut off lead gen. Yeah. You know, you got to have constant fresh stream of hot, sexy, profitable leads pouring in. Absolutely. And sometimes you got to use cutting edge technology to, to do that, like AI. Mm. Um, you also got to sharpen up your sales persuasion and influence skills. You, you didn't even realize you were being trained to be a killer in the real estate space when you were hustling shoes. This is very true. Think about that. Yeah, no, it's very true. Like it's you were learning true. how to overcome objections. You yeah. were learning how to how to get told no. You were learning how to find the in or find like that creative way to hack the yeah. system. You know, absolutely. And, and and it served you. I, I tell all young people: if you got one skill to really sharpen, it's sales persuasion and influence. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And and sales it is, and that's the thing about wholesaling, like you mentioned before. The thing about wholesaling is when you realize that real estate is just a byproduct of what you're selling and the real business you're in in wholesaling is marketing and sales, and then you that you have a way better chance of being more successful because market the marketing and sales piece, when you stop marketing, you don't have a business anymore. And if you don't know how to ask questions, you don't know how to talk to how to talk talk to sellers or even buyers, then you really don't have a business as well. So I one hundred percent agree with that for sure. Yeah. I give all my uh, students a list of what and how questions because the skill you got to develop is it's called motivational interviewing. Mm. It's how to ask open-ended questions that lead to a, a place where they need to go. Yeah. So that's really what influence is. You know, if I, if I want you to go there, and you want to go there, then I'm influencing the conversation. If I want to go there, but you reluctantly go there, mm. now you're going to have remorse. Yeah. Right? Now I'm manipulating. Mm. Yep. Right? And there's a lot of sales guys that manipulate their way to a deal only to wake up with problems down the road. Very true. Right? They're trying to back out of the contract. They don't want to show the property after they put it under contract. They're, they're, they're trying to sell it to somebody else behind your back. Uh, you know, they just have remorse and yeah. you, you don't want to create, you always want to create win-win deals. You never want one party to feel like they got taken advantage of. And that's where the motivational interviewing comes in. Like, you know, what's happening in your life today to make you want to sell your house to me? Yeah. Right. A really open-ended questions. You know, uh, what, how fast would you like your cash if I was to write you yeah. a cash offer? Is this something you can afford to wait 30 or 60 days, like more like a traditional sale? Or would you like your cash by next Friday? Mm. Right? These little questions that just kind of lead, very yeah. baby steps yeah. to a point. You know, how come you haven't, uh, let me ask you something, TJ. How come you haven't tried selling through a real estate agent yet? Yep. Right? Get Instead of me telling you, hey, I'm a better choice than you selling through a real estate agent. How about you tell me? Yeah. Why you're not selling through yeah, a real estate yeah, agent, right? Yeah. And those skills, um, this is why I love wholesaling, is those you develop those skills in wholesaling, but you want to grow out of wholesaling as fast as you can mm -hmm. to get to where TJ's at, which is really being a real real estate investor, owning assets, Absolutely. creating cash flow, living tax free. So what was the jump for you mm -hmm. from hustler, yeah. wholesaling yeah. to finally getting into the rental biz? Well, you know, for me, I wanted I was 
I was had a goal. I wanted 10 single family houses. While I was working as an engineer, then I was going to leave my full-time engineering position and pursue real estate full-time. That was the goal. Um, for folks who know, most people know that the oil and gas market is very finicky. It could be up and down. The price of oil is high. Your gas prices might be high, but everybody's working. The company, Everybody's making money. And But the issue is when a price drops, then people lose their jobs. And at the time when I, when the price dropped for us, at the time when I was laid off, price oil was about $42 a barrel. And it cost about $46 a barrel to build and produce crude oils and hydrocarbons. So nobody was drilling. My role, though, we were at the face of the economy. So the, the subsea equipment that is used to build and produce crude oils and hydrocarbons, I built them, I fabricated them, we installed them, I took them offshore. We, ins- we oversaw the installation process. And so when they stopped drilling, we don't have any work. And so they essentially said, man, TJ, we literally don't have enough. We have way too many engineers for the projects that we have right now. So, so I was laid off June 1st, 2017. And I had five rental properties at the time. So it was about halfway through my goal. So then I had two options. Should I go back and find another job and continue this path? Or go into real- just go ahead and say, you know what? I'm in here, going to real estate full time. And I chose the latter. And so that's what got me into this thing full time. And let me not glamorize it because it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And but I found a short term rental strategy and I had a house that I was remodeling. I was going to make a traditional short term rental added to my portfolio. I said, let me try this Airbnb thing on this one house. I listed it, didn't get a booking that day, but I woke up the next day with two confirmed reservations and I ran the numbers. I said, man, even at the price that I was, which was lower than the market, if I'm only 50% book, I'm still looking to 2X what I would as a traditional rental net. And I said, okay, there's something to the short-term rental thing. Then I got educated. Then I learned that you didn't even have to own these assets. You can rent them and arbitrage them. And I said, okay, let's, let's, let's burn both ends of the candle. So I started doing both. I would buy a property, to, a single family to a four unit, fix it up, add value, of course, to your typical Burr strategy or and and or I'll pick up an arbitrage unit in the process. And so I was kind of burning both heads in the candle. That's how I was able to scale my business uh, for sure. But And then it kind of was this natural progression because I decided that uh, I loved my, t- my two units, my three units, my four units, because I was renting out each unit, but then I was also creating another listing to rent out the entire building. And I was always able to make a lot more renting out multiple units at a time. And so that's kind of what turned on my brain to have multiple doors in one location. And that's why I wanted to do boutique hotels. And at first, I kind of started having a hard time finding these boutique hotels. So then I decided that I was just going to buy an apartment complex and just run it like one. Why don't I just create my own boutique hotel with the way I know how to purchase multifamily assets? And that's what I kind of started doing. And so now we're looking at, you know, boutique hotels. We're looking at more of that. And we're also now looking at flagship branded hotels as well that we're going to be closed, that we're looking to pick up too as well. So that, 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 that's there you go. The way. So yeah, what, what, yeah, when you yeah. say flagship branded hotels, yeah. Are you talking about like, uh, like, like, like I think of like you have Hilton and yeah. then you have Conrad. Yeah. The signature series, <laughs> yeah. kind of like the one off, like a yeah. little bit more luxury, nicer. Is that what you're talking about? So we're talking about, we're talking about the Brandon ones, the Hiltons for sure. We're talking about that, the Marriott's, you know what I'm saying? You're a residence. There's a residence in that we're looking at right now. Um, holiday ends, things like that. Um, so, those, so you'd buy one of those old buildings and convert it to nah, like, what are you talking about? We'll buy, we'll buy them already existing. One that's already there, a Marriott that's already existing, a Hilton that's already No, that's existing. what I mean. Right. So you're going to buy one of these hotels that were being yeah. traditionally ran as a hotel, uh-huh. but convert it to what? Is no, it, it, no need to convert it. We're going to keep them branded. Oh, you're just you know, going in the hotel business. business. Yeah, we're going to the hotel. Oh, business I see where sure. your head's at. You're, you're thinking real big. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna keep. And it's interesting because you've been getting into the hotel space. You you realize that it's kind of a different ball game. And now I really see why hotels aren't like a normal, uh, like place and asset that people are just normally buying as popular as you know single family homes or multifamily even land because it's you literally it's a it's a place you have to relationship your way <laughs> into the hotel space for sure and it's interesting how hotels actually see Airbnb because they actually see Airbnb as just another brand um like just another Marriott or just another Hilton and when you start getting into the space and you're talking to start talking to a lot of hoteliers they're not necessarily worried about Airbnb honestly <laughs> they look at Airbnb as a brand which makes sense because if I own a Marriott right now, I'm going to be paying a fee to Marriott franchise fee, which is essentially what you're doing. You're franchising these brands anywhere between 10 to 15 percent, depending. And just like we pay a fee to Airbnb, it's just Airbnb is just one. It's a, it's, a, it's a hotel brand essentially that's just all over, right? Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of how how they, how they see the 
brand. But but yeah, the, to me, there's no reason why we can't do both short term rentals and be branded hotels. So there you go. I like play it together. I'm in, man. Whenever you're raising money for your your hotels, I want in. Oh man, done and done. You know, I'm in on that. That's cool. I have <laughs> some friends that own hotels. They uh they kill it. They yeah, do really well. Yeah, yeah. Um. All right. So let's talk about the Airbnb business because yeah. there are there is some tips and tricks and hacks and oh, different yeah. ways to run it. So you're a professional operator, yes. right? Like, um, you've really put a lot of thought into the system itself. Oh, yeah. All right. So like, just walk us through some of the core pieces. Yeah that people would need? Because you don't just get a property, throw some furniture in it, throw it up on Airbnb and call no. it a day. Yeah, no, no. And and, um, and that's the mistake that a lot of people are doing right now. See, between, let's see, 2020 and 2022, just that two-year span, the number of short-term rentals in the nation increased by over 60%. That's a lot more listings that have entered and flooded the marketplace. And so, of course, everything's still based on supply and demand. The issue is, is that unfortunately, most of the listings that came out to this marketplace are people that are just trying to earn a quick buck on the platform. And they don't know how to handle security issues properly, don't know how to screen a guest properly, and then provide a, a bad experience for the guests, which overall hurts the short-term rental industry overall. And so this business right now, is nowhere near like what it was before in terms of for, for one the ease of getting these getting arbitrage units or even getting co-hosting units the ease of it before is a lot more challenging now because Airbnb has gotten to a place to where even the name of it has got some in some places get 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 a bad rap and so right now this business is meant for the business owner this business is meant for the people who are running it the right way and I tell people all the time there's no shortage of good hosts matter of fact we need more good hosts on the platform it's actually a bigger tragedy because you probably have already heard about this term Airbnb bust. You probably already heard about people complaining about Airbnb slowing down and things like that. To me, that's not even the biggest issue because there's no shortages of good hosts. The issue is the ones that aren't doing it right. Because a lot of times, and this is what hotels have over us, is the consistency piece. So I tell hosts, be good hosts Prioritize um, who you are as an operator and prioritize the guest experience. Because what happens is, People get a lot of inconsistent experiences on Airbnb. They may have a good experience with this host here. Then the next time they book an Airbnb, it's not a good experience. Then the next one may be an okay experience. The next one may be a good experience. Then the next one's a bad experience. Then another bad experience. And what happens is that inconsistency allows people to now leave to go book hotels. And a lot of times when we lose people from Airbnb to a hotel, most of the time we're not getting them back into the Airbnb space. This is the bigger tragedy over Airbnb bust or Airbnb slow down or houses not not working to sit on the market on the Airbnb. The bigger tragedy are bad hosts. <laughs> That's the bigger tragedy because we're losing our guests to hotels because hotels got us beat on what consistency they have us beat there. But again, this is meant for the for the business owner. If you want to get into the space, for one, get your foundation right. What I mean by that is get in your when, when I say foundation, your operations, your systems. If you want to get into arbitrage, your biggest challenge will be how to speak to the pain points of the landlord. And you have to address the pain points. And, I, and I'll give you all the pain points of a landlord, what matters to a landlord right now. The rent's getting paid on time. I actually show landlords, I said, look at these, look at these consistent rent payments that we make to our, our, our other arbitrage clients. The, the property being well taken care of. Here's the thing. You literally, if you see yourself and you know who you are as an operator, you know that you are the perfect tenant because nobody is going to take care of this property the way you're going to take care of it. So sp speak and emphasize on that, how the property is going to be insured. Uh, make sure that they know that, how the maintenance is going to be handled. Because the thing is, is that that's one of the biggest bottlenecks and issues for landlords is maintenance issues. We actually handle maintenance issues up to $200. So that broken toilet, that clogged toilet, that leak in the water heater, we'll take care of that on our expense. Don't even worry about it. And if it's anything more than that, guess what? We can still oversee the process. We can have our contractors come, come, come manage it and we'll oversee it. And we can invoice you for it. We can take it out the rents just to make it easier for you. But this is how we make sure we're the perfect tenant. And no, I don't pay more because a lot of people might say, well, we're going to let you make money from it. So we want more rents. Why would I give you more rents when I'm literally going to be the best tenant you ever had? If uh, somebody regular comes rent this property from you and they damage this property and they didn't take good care of you, you're not going to charge them more rents because I'm the prize here. And that's the mindset you have to go into if you want to do arbitrage. Understand the value that you bring because if you don't have that confidence, if you don't understand the value, it's a lot less deal that you're going to be able to get. When I work with uh, landlords now, it's almost like I feel bad for you if you don't work with me. 
that's the that's the mentality going into it. So understanding who you are, understanding the identity of you are as an operator for one is going to be very important. Have the confidence when you go in to lock in these arbitrage deals. Your systems and operations is going to be crucial. Two things that you can do at the very beginning to save you a ton of time. Manage your pricing. And you have to manage your pricing from the very beginning and make it dynamic. Don't have stagnant pricing. Because when you have dynamic pricing, these OTAs, what I mean by OTAs, I mean online travel agencies. These are your Airbnbs, Booking.com, VRBO. They see you as attentive because you're checking... Just checking your calendar actually gives you a slight boost when you consistently check your calendar because they see you as an attentive host. So get your pricing right. Make sure it's dynamic. Use Price Labs. Use Wheelhouse. Use Beyond. One of those three is the three that I recommend. Get your pricing dynamic. Also, your guest communication. You can use Hospitable for this, and they are great at communicating with your guests and making sure that your response rate stays at 100%. These are two things that I will automate at the very beginning of your journey because one, it's going to save you about 70% of your time off the muscle and it keeps your response rate at 100%, which which, uh, matters a lot in how you rank. Also keeps your pricing, makes you look like an attentive host and it keeps your pricing dynamic, not stagnant, which also speaks to how high you rank in the SEO searches as well. So those two things from the very beginning will save you time and keep your listing relevant for sure. And dynamic pricing is literally what it sounds like. Every, every once in a while, they might refresh and the pricing changes a little bit. It, the price, exactly. And, yeah. you want, and you want those prices to kind of fluctuate over time because, and, and, and dynamic pricing doesn't necessarily mean set it and forget it because a lot of people will say, okay, well, I'll use price line. Let me just set my minimum price, my base price, and I'm out of it. You have to also understand there's a such thing called rule sets that you have to be able to leverage and use on Airbnb. Airbnb also incentivizes listings that give big discounts. So just because you set your, your your prices with your dynamic pricing tool don't mean you shouldn't. It's, it's not just to set it and forget it. You should still go into your listing and use rule sets to fluctuate your prices as well to give discounts for your listings. Because again, that will also allow you to be, uh, uh, that will also speak to how attentive you are and, and keep your, your calendars relevant as well. And you, you were mentioning guest communication because guest communication is vitally important because you need to run this like a business. You know, we have, I don't know, 40, 50 Airbnbs running right now. Nice. Um, And uh, they're to get, to keep the rankings high or to keep the uh, reviews high. (laughs) So many of our listeners reach out and they ask us how they can get involved in my actual real estate deals. Our investment firm specializes in finding deeply discounted properties acquiring them, renovating, stabilizing both single family and multifamily properties all over the United States. That's why we're so excited to share with you clevercapitalfund.com. Now, if you have some investment capital and you want to deploy it and receive double digit returns back by real estate, then visit our website and see which fund is right for you. We have both equity funds and we have debt funds where you just get paid out every month like clockwork. All you got to do is visit www.clevercapitalfund.com today to learn more. The whole thing is guest communication. You yes. mentioned maybe running like a hotel, having that consistency. Our guy meets every one of our guests out at the front door. Mm. You know, like we're very, you know, we leave them little snack basket, nice. baskets and stuff when they come in. There's already water sitting in there. There's this proper turnover. And, you know, we're, 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 we're really trying to make sure that their experience is as if they, yeah. they did check in. They almost feel like a little concierge service. And you were mentioning two, a couple tools for yeah. guest communication. What are those tools again? So guest communication, well, for one, it used to be smart b but they're now hospitable. Definitely check out hospitable. But hospitable is now a full-on channel manager now. So now they don't just focus on the guest communication piece, but they all focus on the overall channel management where all your all your um, your listings are linked from VRBO, Booking.com, and Airbnb. They also have a direct booking site function, which now other other channel managers have this function as well. So Hospitable is a good one. We love using Guesty. We use Guesty in our business. Guesty is a good one. They handle the guest communication as well. Most of the channel manager have that guest communication function now. So really, you can you can get tapped into multiple tools for that function. Okay, so right out of the gates, hit those couple things up. Yeah. And how is important, in your opinion, theming out the property? Yeah. So it's interesting because themes are good. 
And themes are important because why? Themes allow you to stand out. And you need to be put an emphasis on design in this business. See, times have changed. I mean, expectations have also changed. So when I got into it back in 2017, you probably could have just picked up a couch from the street, picked up a, a, a bed from anywhere, and probably still went crazy in this business because it was still so new. Now things have changed. <laughs> and so that means that expectations have changed drastically as well. And so you need to make sure that you emphasize design. You need to emphasize design and themes. Theme of your units can be pretty good. Now, I would caution, though, to a theme with intention and theme with a purpose, because like if you go with like a full on zebra theme, right, you may if and if you want longer term guests, your loud theme may kind of turn away those people that want to stay for longer terms or midterm stays monthly or weekly and stuff like that. But if you have a theme that's more subtle. Right. Those are the people that may you may attract those people that want to stay longer term. So your loud theme is great, but it'll work a lot better from a short term rental perspective versus a midterm to long term rental perspective. So theme with intention and theme is great. Again, of course, if they work amazing with your design, I'm one of my good friends, Mike, he has an amazing theme, a Disney theme in one of the closest neighborhoods in Orlando that allows short term rental. Uh, I booked his 11 bedroom, nine and a half bathroom Airbnb. Each room is themed. This has a super, super dope Disney theme, and it just works for that area. And they went crazy. Custom bunk beds, the Avengers. I mean, it's just, they went super crazy. And it's, those are the kind of intention that you have to put in design. So, and that makes sense because totally you're coming sense. to Orlando to go to, Absolutely. you know, Disney or Epcot or whatever, Absolutely. Universal Studios. That makes a ton of sense. Absolutely. I see it at the um, bowling alley houses. Have you ever seen those? Oh, yeah. yeah. They're out oh, there yeah. in Orlando those, too. Those nice. uh, if you're listening, I believe you can Google bowling alley. Orlando rental, short-term rentals, and uh, he hit the news and all kinds of stuff. Nice. He was a he was a really interesting guy. Uh, reminded reminded me of you, man. Young yeah. hustler, immigrant dude. I, he might have been from Nigeria. It was something like that. Love you it. you got you should maybe reach out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But I I loved his theme. He actually convinced the builder of this subdivision to customize their floor plans because he was going to buy three or four of their houses in a row. Mm. And all he wanted was uh, more bedrooms and bathrooms and a bowling alley nice. in every house. Nice. So he had four of them built in a row with bowling alleys in each one. There's like a space theme, like a superhero theme, like a water world theme, right. uh, whatever. Thing. And uh, he was really smart because he um, built four, turned, turned them on, had mm. guests showing up. Mm -hmm. A lot of people from New York coming down, bring their family to Orlando, whatever. Nice. Put advertising in the, when you first check in. And he would also show up, build a relationship with you and pitch you on this. But his goal was to get two of the four sold to get rich guests. Mm. So that way he can cash out of them and pay, pay off the other two mm. and just make crazy money off the other two. I see so he would did. do four in order to keep two and sell two. I like it. It was brilliant, man. I like it. I like, I like that it. hustler, hustler energy. Um, all right. Uh, how do people screw up on the Airbnb side of things? <laughs> what are some things to avoid? Because yeah. I know for me, like we've had issues because we didn't know what the hell we were doing with like bad guests. And mm -hmm. then it's like, oh my God, now we need to figure out like, do you like background check these people? Do mm -hmm. you Google them? Mm -hmm. uh, is it a last minute booking? Are they in state last yeah, minute booking? Exactly. Like I, we started paying attention to like, who's trying to party at our pads? Yeah, yeah. And to me, and it's funny you gave that example too, because that's one of the main ways people mess it up is not knowing how to screen their guests properly. And now I, I tell people, like, even when it comes to screening, there's now uh, like really good technology and there's really good uh, companies and softwares that has really entered the short term rental space. Superhawks is one of them. They're really good at screening your guests and also collecting damaged waiver deposits or um, and also insuring your items. Now, this is this is different from um, actual liability coverage that you need general aggregate liability. But also on top of that, ensuring the certain items. So somebody breaks your table, breaks your couch, things like that, your bed. Um, and again, those things paid out really quick and also has a background check function uh, to, uh, with that as well. Um, What'd you safely, call it? Red uh, Hawks? Uh, Super Hogs. Super, Super Hogs. Hogs. Super Hogs, yeah. Okay. Um, hogs. <laughs> That's uh, a weird name. Uh, the Hog is a host of guests or something like that. The hog stands for something. That's okay. why I call it super hog, something right. like that. Um, Safely is another one. They do something very similar as well. Um, I'll also check out Wavo, which is actually a super sister company to Proper Insurance, which is the main insurance provider for the short-term rental space. They all do something very similar, including the background checks, as well as 
um, helping protect your property with additional insurance uh, policies and things like that, protecting your items. Um, that helps a lot because uh, a lot of them they do they'll they'll the, the background checks kind of kind of help out, and a lot of people that. At, that know that you're going to do a background check on them, they will probably bow out of, of booking the property. So it's another way that you protect your property. Another way that, that, that another thing that people mess up is they don't really understand that how much their pricing factors into the type of guest that's going to come into their property as well. So the pricing matters. There's like this Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom analogy that we use in a short-term rental space. Think about what happens at Walmart. You have Walmart, Target, and Nordstrom, they all sell t-shirts. They all make profit selling t-shirts. But the biggest difference is the quality, the type of people that buys those T-shirts. And you can think about what happens at Walmart, especially during holiday season, all the riffraff that goes on. So if you have a Walmart level property, I mean, yeah, you'll make money, but understand what comes with it. Um, then you have you can go with a Target, which is like, your, you know, your mid-grade level property. And that comes with its own problems, with it, but that's a little bit better. Then there's the Nordstrom level. And you, 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 a Nordstrom level is a property that's really nice, very nicely designed, not cheapened. Um, but it attracts a certain type of people that's willing to spend the money to stay there. And those are the kind of people that usually tend to not have bad intentions for your property as well. So people mess, th- people mess a lot of things up by not screening their guests properly, um, but definitely just gave some good resources on that for sure. Definitely check out Super Hall. Definitely check out Safely. Definitely check out Wavo to help protect your property. Um, along with that, for one, people aren't um, also confident in when they go do rental arbitrage. We talked about that earlier. Switching your mindset and how you approach landlords will help you close a lot more deals because a lot of people come with a scarcity mindset versus a confident mindset. People mess that up. If there's, if there's one thing that I would change in the, in the beginning of my journey, I would have a lot more arbitrage units if I did it the right way. It's the confidence that I have uh, going into it. So definitely people mess that up uh, as well. Let's, let's unpack that a little yeah. bit. What would be your advice for somebody who's new? A little overwhelmed, They're trying to figure out all yeah. these. I mean, you just spit off 13 softwares and <laughs> pieces uh, of things that they got to start thinking about in order to pull this off. I don't have a lot of confidence, TJ. Yeah. I mean, I'm your new student. Yeah. Talk to me. Oh, man. How are you going to coach me up? For one, uh, definitely have a script down, play, uh, down pack. There's a script that we use in our in our coaching business, and our and our students love it. Um, the script is awesome because it does such a good job at speaking to the pain points um, of a landlord, for sure. Um that's that's going to come that's going to be very very crucial because what's going to happen is once you know how to speak to the pain points of a landlord and you know how to address it and you know that listen I'm going to be I'm your best solution to finding the best tenant for your property and the way I'm coming at you is me knowing that and my job is to, for you to understand that I am the, the best tenant you're ever going to have and a perfect tenant we have a whole business plan in our in our business called the perfect tenant business plan that we use to give to, give to landlords as well that help us seal the deal as well and it just literally addresses all their pain points on paper. And so that's uh, actually brilliant because you're yeah. showing them how yeah. we're going to get how how you are the perfect tenant and also how you're going to treat their property. Oh yeah. Uh we, so it's like it's like selling without oh, yeah. having to sell. Absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and so that is going to come, that's going to be very, very crucial for people that are looking to get into the arbitrage space because now the arbitrage space is very scrutinized. It's talked, it's talked down on quite a bit. Um, and, and because a lot of people have gotten into it so much because the barrier to entry is lower, uh, a perceived barrier to entry is lower. And so a lot of people are getting into it. So you're going to really have to figure out how to stand out, how to have these conversations, how to ask questions, because asking questions is a very high income sales skill, how to ask questions. And that's going to speak a lot to, to the confidence in you getting these listings for sure. I always uh, tell my students like, look, you can't, you can't focus about all the what ifs in the future. Oh, you, yeah. you really got to just stay present. Like, look, yeah, maybe, maybe you're going to walk in today and you're going to ask a couple questions and they're going to give you their property. And before you know it, you're in the game. Oh yeah. You're printing cash, you're making money, you're having fun. And then you turn around the next day, you wake up and the person tells you no. Yeah. And you got to deal with that. And you got to deal with that. Yeah. It's yeah. like, but if I'm already stressed about tomorrow's no, it's really hard to get today's yes. Oh, man. And think about this. When I first, and I and I love the advice of reading a script, you know, professionals use scripts. Yeah. We get to a point where we memorize the script yeah. and we don't have to use the script physically, but the script is in our mind. Yeah. But we took the time to, as, as a thought, to really model out, how do I want this conversation to go? What kind of questions am I going to ask them? How am I going to frame my offer, right? Because we're making the seller an offer or the property owner an offer. 
right? And they got to yeah. understand what we're doing and they got to have confidence in us. And if we're, if we're winging it, yeah. which is not a strategy, yeah. they're not going to have confidence. Therefore, we're not going to have confidence and the whole thing's a, a negative feedback loop. Oh, yeah. So um, I always tell people, you know, definitely get your hands on some scripts. And for me, my mentor, Lyle, gave me a script mm. because I was in the wholesaling business and I didn't really know how to talk to potentially motivated sellers. I didn't know how to ask these questions and new, new investors t- over- talk themselves right out of deals. Oh, yeah. They over talk. Oh, yeah. And they oversell and they, they bring up objections that aren't even maybe even in the seller's mind yet. And it's because they're just barfing out information towards them. And it's like, oh, I never even thought about that. that and now, now they're tripping on <laughs> something else that, that, that wasn't even a thing. And uh, f- this is a great story because when I first got into the business, I was terrified to talk to sellers on the phone. Mm. I don't know why I had this hang up. And I think it's because I, like you, have a very analytical part of my personality yeah. that likes to know what's going to happen next. And if I don't have it all mapped and planned out, I freeze a little bit. Yeah. And it's, I, my, my two sides of my personality battle each other because there's part of me that's very much like, let's just go get it. And yeah. the other part of me is like, let's slow it down. Let's not look like an idiot out there. Yeah. And I was really worried about getting told no. Um, and so I had this script and every day, Lyle, my mentor would say, Cody, did you make your calls? And I would lie to him. Mm. And I would say, yeah, yeah, I made some calls today. He'd be like, okay, how'd it go? Oh, not a lot of people interested. I'll get back at it tomorrow. And for weeks, I was kind of bullshitting him. And he would check in every few days, like, how are the calls going? Oh, you know, having conversations. I wasn't talking to anybody. Mm. That phone might have been 10,000 pounds, mm. right? Because I was just terrified to get hung up on or, or told yes and then not know what to do yet next. Yeah. So I was in analysis paralysis. Oh, man. Oh, man. And finally, one day, Lyle got pissed because he knew I was bullshitting. He's like, there's nobody, there's nobody in this business that's making the calls like I'm telling you make the calls and has nothing. Yep. Right? And so he called me out and I lied to him. And my deal with him is I had three strikes and I was not allowed to, if I lied to him and got caught, you know, I get a strike, third strike, he stops working with me. Mm. So I finally, he, he said, Cody, I know you're bullshitting me. He goes, get your scripts. Okay. We're done with this BS, get your scripts. And you're going to meet me at this address, write this address down. And I'll meet you there at midnight tonight. Mm. And I'm like, why do we got to wait till midnight? He goes, don't ask any questions. Just meet me there at midnight. I'm living in, sh- I'm living part-time with my parents at the time, part-time with my girlfriend who became my wife, Shannon. Mm. And uh, so, and I have this piece of shit Nissan pickup truck. Mm. I drive to the address at midnight with my scripts and it's a graveyard. I show up and I'm like, it's a cemetery. And I'm like, oh, this guy, you know, like really, he wants me to meet him at a cemetery in the middle of the night. I wait for 35 minutes. Lyle does not show up. Oh, wow. He calls me. He says, you, you, you there? I said, yeah, I'm there. Where are you? And he goes, I'm not going to a cemetery in the middle of the night. He goes, you got your scripts? I said, yeah. And he goes, walk out into the middle of the cemetery and stand in the middle of it. So I walk out and I said, yeah, I'm here. What's up? And he goes, we're going to role play right now. Wow. And for about 40 minutes, we role played, reading scripts. He was the seller. I, I was the investor. And then we would flip flop. And I just read the script and read the script. And we kept repeat. Let's start over. Repeat. Let's start over. Repeat. After about 40 minutes, it just started to click for me. I understood what he was doing. And he stopped me about 40 minutes in and he said, Cody, I'm just going to shoot to you straight. You sound great. You got the script. You know what to say. And if, you, if not, nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to reach through the phone and slap you around. Even if they hang up on you and tell you no, it's not that big a deal. But here's the reality. You're in your own way. And if you can do this as good as you're doing it right now in midnight in a very scary place, you can definitely do it tomorrow morning in your dress PJs Mm. in the comfort of your own home. So stop fucking around and get on the phones because unless you talk to people, you're not getting deals. That's the whole business, bro, is rapport building, influence, get deals. That's it. And you got to stay consistently on the phones or in their house. Like you got to go to people's houses and get out of the classroom, get into the real world and just go for it. And it just clicked. The fear went away. I don't, I can't explain it other than a great mentor allows you to discover the truth. Mm. Right. And he could have told me all day long, you're being a wuss. Stop acting like this. Just get on the phones. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I I couldn't get out of my own way Mm. until I discovered it for myself. And I was so grateful for that because uh, oh, one last lesson because I was about to leave and he said, oh, one more thing real quick. 
You see all those people in their graves? 99% of them slid into their graves full of regret. They never played full out. They didn't live life on their own terms. They didn't set new standards. They never pushed boundaries. Nobody's writing books about these guys. Nobody's building statues about them. You want to be part of that minority of people that elevate, set intention, and set enthusiasm, and break through, and people do write books about them, and talk about them, and really leave a real legacy, you got to raise your standards and raise your enthusiasm. Yeah. You're in a great business that's going to change your life if you just get out of your own way. Yeah. And I was like, damn, this guy. Man. So good. It was such a great lesson. Um, But from that day forward, I was so thankful because I was a monster on the phones. I changed from like not wanting to do it all. Like I couldn't get enough of it. Mm. You couldn't keep me off the phones. I would, I would, I'd, I'd bang phones for seven, eight hours a day. Mm. I'd be calling people at nine, 10 o'clock at night. They're getting mad at me for calling them <laughs> late, right? Hey, wake up. We got to do a deal. Uh, and it just, it, it changed everything for me. And, and wow. that's, that's why I was able to get a deal. I'm 14 months, 12, 12 of it trying shit on my own. Yeah. Two of it with a mentor, get my first deal, exactly. 40K. Exactly. Everything changes, man. Wow. When you wow. get out of your own way. Wow. Man, you, 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 you have to, that's, that's, that's powerful. That's powerful. Um, you know, I tell, I tell my students all the time, you know, every time, because one of the things that we do massively now is creative financing. We love buying our short-term rentals creatively. And when my students, they will, they will talk to sellers and I tell them that, and one of them, uh, Boris, he called me, he said, man, he said, man, I, I seem like I'm not getting anywhere with these sellers. <laughs> I'm not getting anywhere with these sellers. And, and I said, man, hey, look, what I, what I want you to do is keep going. And then we role played some. And then uh, I said, I want you to keep going because what I don't want you to, do is to discount the quiet work. Because a lot of times, because it's one thing to, to, to make an effort, make calls, and you feel like you're not getting success and wake up the next day and do it all over again and feel like, man, okay, I'm in the same spot, but I'm going to do it all over again. And I told him, I said, well, what, what's happening is that quiet work is still happening because even every time you get a no, let's fine tune it. And let's still rejoice because of the no, because we're getting closer to that next yes. Every no is going to get you closer to that next yes. So you have to keep it going. When I was uh, when I was still doing rental arbitrage, heavy, heavy, in the beginning of my journey, this is 2017, 2018, I remember I sat and talked to this lady uh, at, at this condo community. I said, hey, so um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing this Airbnb thing. And um, I want to I want to I want to rent out this property. I think it's really nice for the people that we that we serve. And this, and she says, are you freaking kidding me? So I want to understand you want to rent this property out and you're going to make more money on top of it. And you just expect us to be like, just okay with it. And she said, I don't have time. She said, you get it. You kidding me. I don't have time for this. She gets up. I'm in her office. She gets up and just walks out of her own office. And I'm just sitting, sitting there and I'm like shaking, like what the heck just happened? And I got up and I just sped walk to my car. <laughs> <laughs> I just sped walk to my car and, and, but guess what? I started doing right after that. I went to the next building. I kept going. I didn't even, I, I, oh, I, I didn't even, this. I just kept going to the next, to the next building that I had scheduled for. And that was very, very discouraging. Probably discouraged a lot of people. But the thing is that if I didn't keep going, I wouldn't be here. I would be here if I didn't keep going. So you, you can't discount the quiet work for one. And when you, fail or when you get that no, you have to have the mentality to switch it, to to switch that no into propelling you to that next yes and understanding what that no really means. And so, man, I love that story a lot, bro. Dude, sure. you know, how important is mentorship? Oh my goodness. You know, because I, I think a lot of people are scared to cut that check to, to pay for a mentor. Yeah. They think, oh, I should get free mentorship. Yeah. It's like, maybe you can. Maybe you can work your way in, but there's a cost for sure. It oh, might yeah. not be you cutting a check to get their attention immediately, but you will work for that person oh, for yeah. a really long time. Make them a lot of money yeah. in order to learn, and it's going to take you a lot longer because you're you, you're learning through being on the job, yeah. right? Um, and you and obviously you paid for some mentorship, and then you went off and got other mentors. How important is mentorship to you? It's to me, mentorship is a cheat code. Um, because what mentorship does is it puts you in proximity, it puts you in the room, and it helps you go bigger, better, faster. Along with that, not only is the knowledge that you're gaining, but the confidence that you'll have because you know you have somebody that has your back. You, if you have a good mentor, on on top of that, you also have to consider the fact that mentorship 
speaks a lot. You you realize when you do mentor when you, when you when you have a great mentor, how much more relationships will take you further than any one asset. I don't care how much equity you have. I don't care how much cash flow you're making. Your relationships will take you way further than any of your assets can. And a good mentor will not only give you the education that you need, but also put you in rooms and um, and also put you in a position to make a uh, healthy, good relationships that is going to propel you in your business. So man, the mentorship, mentorship piece to me is the cheat code. Like getting a good mentor. Well, think about this. Two, two thoughts on this. One, you paid seven grand yeah. back in 2013 or 14 yeah. for, to join my mentorship program and you bought a course and then you worked it. You did some deals. Yeah. You realized, hey, Sperber taught me wholesaling, taught me the language of real estate, but that's not that's not my passion. I'm gonna I'm gonna lateral over here to this other niche within the real estate space, but it got you in the game. Absolutely. Years later, we're reconnecting. And uh, then I'm having you up on my stages. Yeah. Then I'm connecting you to the the, the big Absolutely. leagues, right? Absolutely. And and now you're you're like just your trajectory is so cool to watch because you're 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 accelerating so fast. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's cool. It's really cool to watch. But there's a lot of TJs that came in my world, mm. but you cut the check, mm-hmm. right? And yep. that that planted a seed that yep. now I'm paying attention. Yep. I pivoted. Yep. I'm paying attention to you, TJ. What you going to do with this? Because not my job as your mentor to do it for you. And that's the other fallacy around mentorship. Oh, I paid you. How yeah. come I'm not, ki- I'm not rich and killing exactly. it? It's like, no, I gave you the system. <laughs> I gave you the blueprint. I, I let you leverage my relationships, Facts. my knowledge, my tools, my systems, my team. But it's up to you to show up every single day and put in the work. I'm not going to, I don't need you to go do deals. I'm already doing deals, yep. right? I'm here to help you and support you, but I ain't going to do it for you. Uh, and that's one thought. And the second thought is, think of, think of this. I have mentors in a bunch of areas of my life, right? Do you have any other mentors outside of real estate? Oh, man. People yeah, you go absolutely. to maybe on the spiritual side or oh, the health man. side or- Oh, yeah. Right? On every aspect, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do you think about as you've come up from, like you were raised by a single mom? Mm-hmm. Look, I'm sure, couldn't even pay for college. You had to be scrappy and figure out your own, your own way to, to pay for it. I'm sure you you didn't grow up with a silver spoon in your mouth. Mm-mm. You you got to figure out a way to get in these yeah. mentors' worlds. You have to. Whatever that costs. Um, do you think about money differently now mm. and how you pay for speed, yeah. pay to be in rooms? It yeah. changes, right? It changes. TJ from 2010 is probably a whole different TJ as, as far as your financial literacy the way you think about money, the way you use money. Absolutely. What's changed? Oh, man. The mindset and actually looking at it as an expense versus an investment. And for me, that was a mindset shift that occurred because from when I look at, when, when it's not even about how much money it's going to cost me. If I join a mastermind for 50 grand, what am I getting out of that? It's the, it's the fact that that 50 grand is going to quadruple over time in relationships and opportunities. And that mindset shift is, is what's going to open your mind up to say, all right, yeah, I'm just cut this check because I, I know this is where I need to be. And you're going to cut the check. And a lot of times you hear, sometimes it's okay to pay for friends. Sometimes it's okay to pay to get in the rooms to build amazing relationships that will, that will, that will last you in not only in your life, but in your business. And that's okay. And, but it will take a mindset shift to understand that. Outside of because the mindset shift is this isn't an expense. This is an investment into myself and my business. Think about this. Lately, people are really because of social media, they understand what a mastermind is now more than ever. Yeah. Right? Guys like us are talking about join our mastermind. Come yeah. be, you know, we have our mastermind um three times a year where we get everybody together and it's 35 grand on the low end, it's a hundred grand on the high end. Mm. And we put 150 to 175 people in a room. They're all heavily qualified because they all cut that check. Mm-hmm. That means they're all dedicated to making a lot of money. They're there to build relationships and do business and lend each other money and learn new skills and capabilities. Um, uh, but even if you don't cut the check to be in a mastermind and you cut the check to go to Harvard or Stanford, you're still paying for those relationships. Those, pres- <laughs> those people that went to Harvard, they only went to Harvard because they knew that the other people going to Harvard are going to go off to be kings and leaders of, of the universe. Facts. And they're like, all right, I got to get next to these people. Facts, and they get in the room. It's the good old boys club. And even I pay for I pay for friendships all the time. Yeah. I pay for proximity. 
Absolutely. Yeah. One, one of my mentors is a guy named Joseph McClendon the oh, third. Our boy, man. our boy Joseph. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. amazing, man. He 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 works with Tony Robbins for the last, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. Uh, and uh he tell he told me this story one time. He he got paid to coach an Olympic runner. Mm. And this Olympic runner was having a massive mindset blockage. He couldn't figure out why he couldn't run. It, he, I believe he was a long distance runner, maybe the mile or something. Mm. He was trying to get a four minute mile or something like that, but he couldn't. And mentally he had this blockage. And so he said, Joseph, will you work with me? And Joseph said, well, here's my fee if you want me to work with you. And obviously if you don't do what I tell you to do, then we're done, right? So there, there are no like leeway. Like you do what I say, otherwise I keep your money and we're done. And the guy said, okay. And him and his coach are the ones who hired Joseph. And so they both said, okay, we're in. And Joseph said, okay, tomorrow meet me at this location. We're going to run. And that, d- that day, Joseph went and set up some cones a mile away and then met at the start line with the coach and the athlete and said, okay, we're going to run to that cone and we're going to see what your time is. And the guy ran and it was like way over four minutes. And the guy's like, see, I told you, I just, for something in my mind, I can't, I can't figure it out. And Joseph says, all right, well, let's run it again. And the athlete said, well, that's not how this works. We don't just run a mile and then reset and try it again. Like I need some time. Uh, Like our body doesn't work like that. And Joseph said, man, you're talking back. I don't get this. Like you want, you want to be the best in the world. You want to break records. You want to, you want to win a gold, go back to the fucking starting line and try again. So the athlete did it again and got a worse time. And he said, see, I told you. And he said, yeah, 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 I hear you. Meet back tomorrow. We're going to do it again. Next day, same shit happened. Ran to the ran to the cone, got a worse time than the day before. And he's like, dude, this is awful. I'm going backwards. And they did this every day for weeks. And it got worse and worse and worse. And in the guy's mind, he's thinking, what kind of fucking coach is this? I pay one of the best personal development experts in the world to help me run faster. And I'm getting worse. Like you are the worst coach ever. And Joseph says, go back to the finish. We're going to the starting line. We're going to do it one more time. They do it even a worse time. And the guy's about to lose it on Joseph. And Joseph says, all right, here's my guarantee tomorrow. I guarantee you're going to shatter the four minute mile on your first run. And the guy said, how is that even possible? For the last couple of weeks, I've been worse and worse and worse. He said, I guarantee it. Guy goes back next day. To, just says, you're about to do it. This is it. I can guarantee it's going to happen. Guy blasts off, runs well under a four minute mile. It's dumbfounded. He couldn't freaking believe it. He's like, how in the hell did you do this? And Joseph says, simple. Every single day, hmm. I move the cone back further and further wow. and further. And you thought in your mind you were getting worse when in reality, you were just putting in that those extra reps. You were running a little bit harder, a little bit further. And now that I moved it back to where it originally should have been, you can see your progress. Wow. When he told me that story, I got goosebumps telling you Mm, that story. When he told me that story, I said, damn, that's what real mentorship is. Yeah. Yeah. Think about that when you're not feeling the progress out there, mm. when each day you just feel this, like you're grinding. Exactly. But you are, like TJ said, the quiet work, you, man. you're putting that quiet work in yeah. and you're moving the needle. You don't realize it don't yet, realize but you are it. planting seeds yeah. and eventually it'll bear fruit. Yeah. And when it does, you'll have exponential growth. Wow. And that's what we're all really looking for. And guess what? It never ends. No. Every new level, there's a new devil. You're going to have to keep fighting. Yeah. You might level up, and you'll have a greatest year it of happens. your life yeah. and you won't even be content with that. Cause yeah. if you're a winner, winners always are pushing. Yeah. We're never sleeping. We're never chilling. Yeah. So. Wow. Bro, know. that is. Mic drop. That is definitely a mic drop. That is powerful, powerful, powerful. That, um, that reminds me of, cause you know, one of my students, um, she was like, we were, we were talking and she says, man, TJ. And she actually started tearing up and she says, I can't. I can't seem like things are just, and she had a lot going on. She's, she's going through a lot. She has a lot of, you know, she has about five kids. Her, her husband are going through a lot. One of the kids is giving her tons of problem. Money's an issue in the family. Um, and, and she said, she was like, well, I can't like, I can't seem to get this thing going. Like what I, I need, I need clear direction. I can't, and you know, the struggle, she's, this is a mental block that she's having. And I told her, I said, well, you know, 
for one, one of, the, one of the biggest issues that you have is you don't have enough wins, right? And you need to give yourself more wins. How do you give yourself more wins? For one, one of the biggest ways is doing what you say you're going to do in, in your business. Now, if you tell yourself, if I, if we, cause we talked, we strategized this. We said that you're going to make 20 calls in a day. Okay. How are we doing with that? If you don't, because if you do, if you tell yourself you're going to do something and you do it and you decide that, you know what, I'm going to win this day. I don't care what comes out of it, but it's not, and I'm not talking about winning in terms of an outcome that comes out of your actions. I'm talking about just completing the action that you set that you're going to do in the first place. Just complete that action. Did you win the day or not? Give yourself more wins and watch the confidence come and watch the, the needle move from that. And so a lot of times that's the, a lot of issues with a lot of people. They don't, they don't, they don't do the things that they say they're going to do even for themselves because the biggest issue is, and I tell people, if you have, if you have a full-time job and your manager tells you like, Hey, be at this meeting at this time. Hey, or we need this procedure done at this time, whatever the task that you're doing in your full-time job, guess what you're going to do? You're going to do it. If your manager tells you to do it, you're going to do it hundred percent. Why? Because you don't want to lose your job and it's your job. But when we decide that we're going to do something for ourselves in our business and life gets in the way, we negotiate with ourselves all the time. I guarantee if life gets in the way of that job, you're still going to get that job done. Why is it that when life gets in the way for ourselves, we say, okay, instead of, okay, I didn't get to do 20 calls. I did 10. I'll make it up for the, and we're not, we're not doing the things that we say we're going to do because yes, we understand life gets in the way, but you're negotiating with yourself. Why do we negotiate with ourselves? Because we don't, but we don't negotiate with that job. If we're being honest, we don't respect ourselves enough as much as we do that job that we have. So if we're trying to really move the needle, stop negotiating with yourself. I'm going to do this no matter what, because guess what? You're going to go to work no matter what. You're going to do that job no matter what, because that's your job. But you decide to do something for yourself because you don't have somebody over you enforcing it. You negotiate with yourself all the time. Stop negotiating with yourself. If you say you're going to do something, execute what you say you're going to do, regardless of the fruit that it bears. You don't even realize the seeds that you're planting. Don't stop negotiating with yourself. Give yourself the same respect that you give that same job that you have and watch the needle move in your business for sure. That was not being non-negotiable with your <laughs> non goals. Non-negotiate with your goals. Ooh. Stop negotiating with and yourself. And do it on different levels too. Look, Think about this on the health side of things. There is a direct connection between health and wealth. Oh, that's facts. And you know what it is? It's not just, I feel better, therefore I have more energy, therefore I can go to work and be more productive. It's hard to lose weight. Yes. It's hard to eat right. There's too many donuts and ice cream choices and snack choices and things being thrown at you. It's hard to say no and stay the course. It's hard to get up every day when you don't feel like it's easy when you feel like it. Yeah. But when you're not feeling like it, yeah. man, it's rainy out and it's cold, it's really hard to do it. Yeah. Right. And that's why there's a real direct connection. Cause if you can overcome yes. on that, then this business stuff is easy. Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. Right. This ain't nothing. It's like make the damn calls. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Talk to talk to as many agents as you can. Talk to as many other wholesalers as you can. Talk to as many other Airbnb hosts as you can. Get your butt in these Facebook groups and be typing away networking with different people in the community. Jumping on Clubhouse. I think I, I heard you on oh, Clubhouse. Yeah. That's one of the ways That's we reconnected, we, oh, yeah. you know, just jumping in these rooms, listening to people talk about real estate. And uh, uh, just, you know, what, what great advice because I can't tell you how many people talk a big game. Yeah. And then you follow up with them a few months later and they're, they went backwards. They went backwards you're like, how yeah. the hell did you go backwards? Yeah. Like you're worse off than I last <laughs> talked to you. Oh, it's because you negotiated. Yeah. You negotiate with yourself. What great advice. Yeah. Stop negotiating with yourself. Damn. All right. So uh, um, anything else that we didn't cover on Airbnb? So I feel like we covered quite a <laughs> we bit. Co we for covered this, quite a bit. This I, episode. I do, I do believe that um, people need to, especially with today's marketplace and the way things are right now, people really need to start taking a really, really hard look at creative financing. I believe that creative financing and the short-term rental industry, just that intersection right there is one of the best places to be in, in real estate in 2020. Well, let's, let's, sure. let's spend about five minutes talking about that and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this thing out strong. When, when we talk about creative finance, mm -hmm. you're talking about 
seller carrybacks, wraparound mortgages, sub two transactions. There's different Lease ways yep. to get into a deal by bypassing the banks, getting yes. the seller to participate and yes. giving you the financing needed. Yep. Okay. And so in some weird way, arbitrage was a creative finance because is. you're getting a deal, yeah. right? You're getting, you're, you're creating a, a cash flowing business from very creative resources. Yeah. Now we're talking about ownership. Yeah. And I think it's really important for people listening to this to really think about ownership because when you own real estate, you have other benefits. You have tax benefits. You have depreciation. You have the ability for that property to go up in value, right? You, you have now the ability for what's called forced appreciation, which is, or forced amortization. That's where the tenant is paying off your loan Yes, and you're building wealth. Yep. And this is how wealthy get wealthy. We don't get wealthy by working our way to wealth. We don't get wealthy by saving our way to wealth. We get wealthy by buying assets and leveraging other people's time, skills, money, and resources to get us wealthy. Yes. And if you own real estate, you're doing a great job of leveraging, yes. right? So talk about what you're seeing out there right now. So so your students, they're, they're what? Looking for what type of creative signals yeah. To find a good deal. Well, for one, you mentioned something important too. Here's the thing. Arbitrage is amazing and we love arbitrage and arbitrage. I want people to look at it as almost like a, a way to get into this game, but the goal should be ownership for sure. Um, and creative financing is, is great because in, in the, along the lines of arbitrage, one of the, one of the, our favorite strategies right now with creative financing is lease purchase and lease options because it combines arbitrage with ownership and you can strike deals with, with sellers and structure a lease agreement to short-term rental their property and a purchase agreement on the front end to buy it at the end of the lease. And this is one way that our students are seeing a lot of success in owning their short-term rentals. I just negotiated. We were on a Zoom call, myself, my, one of my students, and a seller. We were on a call negotiating a house that was free and clear that he's gonna, looking to buy for $190,000. He's going to make it his next short-term rental. I told the, I told the seller, I said, ma'am, we're willing to give you ten k above asking if you're willing to give us our terms, can we send her two different options and, and, and offers? She said, well, this one, we sent her a cash offer and a, and, a, and a creative finance offer. She said, well, this one that that you're looking to pay a little bit more, um, that you're willing to pay me more than I'm asking, how does this one work? And I said, well, here's the thing, ma'am. Even if I was to pay you, because uh, the, the, it was one offer for 170 and then creative finance offer for 210. She, I mean, for, for 200, she was asking 190. I said, ma'am, even if I was to buy this property for 170 with the bank, I said, ma'am, did you... Did, I'm going to overpay the bank anyway. Like I'm paying you less than you're asking, but I'm still going to overpay for this property. She said, what you mean? I said, I said, over, over time, once this loan is done, once I pay it off, we would have paid for this property three times over. So we're going to overpay for this property because of the interest and all the fees that comes with it. But instead of overpaying the bank, we just rather overpay you. Let's just overpay you and let's structure a deal together. And so we light agree, bulb goes light off. Bulb. The seller never even never considered even, that. Never even considered that. And I said, and I said, okay, so we're willing to overpay you, but just give us payments on our term. So we negotiated with or paying her over 10K over asking, principal only, no interest payments. I'm okay paying a little bit more if I'm paying no interest. Why? Because I'm still gonna pay that house quicker. I'm still gonna pay it down quicker. So now we're looking to leverage this property, buy it, principal only payments, no money down principal only payments, get it fixed up. And we would, instead of paying interest only, we're paying principal only now. And that's what makes this deal so sweet. People don't even realize that, for example, if, if, if you were to sell me a house right now, brother, for 500K, if I was to go get a 30-year note on this, on this house of 500,000, in 30 years, uh, my monthly mortgage would be 2997 and I would have paid about $1.2 million over, over 30 years. Three times more. Three than times that. more. So now, but, but, if I were to give you six hundred thousand for your five hundred thousand dollar asking, and give you principal only payments for twenty at twenty five hundred dollars a month, first of all, I'm saving five hundred dollars a month on, on, on payments. And did you know that even me overpaying you, I'm still going to pay that house off ten years sooner than than I would if I was to get a bank. Actually, twelve years sooner than I would if I was to go get a bank. So I'm going to overpay the bank anyway. How about I just overpay you more instead? I'm, I'm still and, in and this, just, TJ. Just, I'm still just, in that. What a great frame. Yes. Who, who, hey, one way or another, I'm overpaying. One way or Would you rather other, have me overpay the bank or overpay, overpay you? you? And, and, and give me payments. That, and, and, and you know what's crazy? Done. On this Zoom call, you know what she said? She said, oh my God, this is a win-win. I didn't even have to say it. <laughs> the seller already saw it off the muscle. Yeah. She said, oh my God, this is a win-win. I said, exactly. Let's do a deal. 
I love it, man. I'm still in that. Um, j- just for everybody <laughs> listening or watching, um, in the United States, 34% of every single family property and condominium out of all the properties, over 30 million of them in the United States are owned free and clear. Mm. It is very easy if you're using a software like the Deal Automator mm. to run a search for free and clear houses in your target area. Yes. And do what TJ says, exactly. just call, call them up and try to work a creative finance deal. What you do with it, property acquisition is a skill, right? What you do with it after that is another skill. It's another skill. It's another skill, you know? This is why we started off talking about how important it is to learn how to talk to people and build that, those relationships, gather data, gather information. Because, you know, TJ, one, one moment might generate a lead, goes down this rabbit hole, builds a relationship with the seller and realizes this ain't a good Airbnb, but it's yep. a perfect wholesale deal. Yep. Right? Or flip, flip the other way. Hey, man, why would I ever sell this for a quick buck? I could turn this thing into an Airbnb. It's right next to the community college or it's right next to this, this uh, place where people travel to a lot or a lake or something like that. Uh, I'm turning it into short-term rental. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's let's end this thing strong. Yes, sir. Okay. First off, you slayed this podcast, you, dude. Appreciate I knew you, you would. Appreciate TJ's you, so good. <laughs> um, for, uh, how do people find you real fast? Uh, tapping with me, social media for sure. Uh, TJ to Johnny. That's T J T I J A N I. You'll find me on all the platform and my YouTube as well. Um, definitely tap on me on there as well. All right, yeah, definitely go check them out. Um, let's end this thing strong. You have a magic time machine. You're able to go back in time mm. and talk to 13 year old TJ. Wow. Right. What were yeah. you like? 13 years old. Uh, uh, I was nowhere near. I was probably about a uh, hundred pounds soaking wet. Uh, that see the way you look at me right now. I had to grow into this. I know you. You know you look at the you look at the the, the muscles. You your at, your medium t shirt. You look at the medium t shirt. <laughs> you look at. I had to grow into this. I had at, at thirteen. I had big old ears. My lips were massive. It was it was a whole. I needed braces really bad. So uh, I, I would go back and tell my thirteen year old self that for one, it's gonna be okay, because even at that age. I was way more stressed than a 13 year old should be. Uh, but I would tell myself that it's going to be okay. And, and I would have told myself to get started even sooner, for sure. Mm. Because a lot of people, see, for the mistake I was making when I was getting into real estate, I was like so hungry and I wanted, but see, I still had this engineering mindset. I feel like I needed to know everything. And I tell people that. Don't be like me. Don't feel like you need to know everything. Just know enough to get going. My best students are the ones that say, "Oh my God, I want I want to get going." And they'll 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 watch they'll watch a video and then they'll say, "Okay, well here's how to find my, my next short term rental." And they'll do that. They say, "Okay, I found it. What do I do next?" They'll go watch the video. Oh, here's how I talk to landlords. Oh my God, they'll go talk to a landlord. Oh, the landlord say yes. Okay, we're good. All right, what do I do next? I'm gonna go back and come to TJ and <laughs> watch the course. Like they take it those because they're action takers. So don't feel like you need to know everything. Just know enough to get going for sure. How do you eat the success elephant one, one bite, at, bite a time. at a time, baby? I love it, man. What great advice! And uh, you know, I think I think every thirteen year old's a little awkward. You weren't alone, <laughs> homie. You weren't alone. Uh, but uh, I am very proud of the man that you Thank have you, become. You are setting such a great standard in this industry, and I'm yeah. just proud to call you a friend. No. And you know, you you always coming up on my stages. Yeah. Anytime I throw an event, you know, I'm bringing you out because you're man. the goat, and I'm. I'm I love you, bro. Man, like, listen, bro. I love you too, man. And I, I'm going to say this now on, on your show because I don't think people really understand the impact you've had um, in my life. But for we, we like you mentioned earlier, I was tapped in with you on, way back in the day when I bought your program. And I came and volunteered at one of your Clever Labs at the time when you were doing that. And so, um, and it's kind of came full circle now. We connected again on Clubhouse. And ever since that one conversation, you came into my room, bro. You came into my room. One day I was hosting my weekly Airbnb room. And you came into my room and you was like, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking to get into some Airbnbs. I'm just trying to soak up some game. And I see an Airbnb room. And ever since then, my life has changed. You blew up that room for one. And then because of that, I tapped into one of your rooms. And that's when you invited me to come speak at the Clever Summit for 2001. And that one was virtual. Changed my life. Even just that virtual one. Came back for 2022 last year. Insane. I feel like I'm still, I'm still benefiting off some residual effects from that one last year, still to this day. So the people that you put me in the room with, the connections, the relationships just with, that I have, 
uh, the mentorship that she's given me. I tell everybody, this is my big brother. This is my mentor. Like, everybody knows. I tell everybody that. Bro, thank you, man. Dude, I love thank that. Thank you so much. Bro. You know what? Uh, that's that's my obligation. My obligation, because you played full out, and you made me pay attention to you. Appreciate you, brother. It's my obligation to create the platform, and it's your obligation to run the ball further down the field. Yes, and sir. you're doing that. Yes, and I sir. think that's why I'm so proud of you because it's like, look, I did I did what I could. Yeah. But you got you got an obligation to go a lot further. And there's a lot of people that need help. The economy's really uncertain right now. It's scary out there. And yeah. people should be doing this business. Yes. This is a great business to be in, and you're a great teacher and leader uh, for them to connect with. Um, you know. Thank you, brother. I feel like it goes both ways because you're my mentor in the Airbnb game. <laughs> I was able to scale last year to get to 40, 50 Airbnbs. Yeah, killed it. I couldn't have done it. Crushing it, man. Without your, <laughs> your telling me, these are the softwares. Yes. This is how you guests communicate. Here's how you avoid the problems. Here's the stuff that we do really well. Here's some examples of Airbnb. You showed the whole model. Yeah. You know, and that's what it's all about. You know, it's like, Okay, Appreciate this is the you, model. I ain't, I ain't messing with the model. <laughs> TJ figured it out. He got bumped and bruised along the way to, to get this dialed in. And now it's I get to benefit from that. That's why it drives me crazy when people want a discount. Yeah. Right? I'm just like, look, bro, no, <laughs> you ain't getting no damn discount. You know, if I want to give a discount, I'll offer a discount. Right. You know, but don't be asking for a discount because you don't know what it took for me to get here. That's fact. That sacrifice is worth way, I, it cost me way more than what you're paying for it. You know, yeah. but uh, anyways, Absolutely. let's end on a positive note. Go follow TJ. <laughs> He's the man. And I appreciate Dang. everybody uh, that uh, tuned in for this episode. You know how we do it. We don't, we don't advertise on this show. Uh, the only thing I ask is that maybe you, uh, if you got some value out of this episode, share it with a friend so other people can get turned on to TJ, to Johnny and uh, the way he does his business. And also just spread the word of financial literacy so more people can get out of the rat race and live life on their own terms. And then maybe if you're feeling froggy, leave us a five-star review. We have, uh, at the time of this episode, over 210 of them. And it's just really cool to see people, you know, taking the time because I know it's hard, it's hard to get people to leave a positive review. It's yeah. easy for them to go online and talk shit. That's very true. Right? But uh, for everybody who's taking the time to leave a positive review, I thank you for that. It means a lot. That's all we got for this episode. Until next time, we're out of here. Take care. Comb your hair. Peace. Hey, thanks for being a subscriber of the Clever Investor Show. As a thank you gift, we wanted to give you something that we know is going to help you get started as a creative real estate investor. It's our real estate success kit, and it's completely free. Just go to www.reisuccesskit.com. Dot com to customize your kit, but essentially it's a collection of 15 training tools designed to help you get results quickly as a creative real estate investor. From systems to lead generation to finding cash buyers to creative ways to close deals and get paid. Your free REI success kit is just a few clicks away. Once again, the website's www.reisuccesskit.com.